patients for our common malignancies and we have to pick up early diseases. So these are the guidelines available for the common cancers like breast cancer, cervical cancer, colon, prostate and lung cancer. So this is how we are intervening that is secondary prevention where the disease has onset whereas there is no symptom. That is how we pick up early diseases. So coming to breast cancer, number one cancer. So because of screening, there is decrease in death rate by around 25 to 25%. That is, one fourth of death can be minimized by screening breast cancer. So those are the various components for breast cancer screening: self breast examination, clinical breast examination, which is done by a trained health physician, and we have to do risk assessment. Where does the patient fits into? And mammography. As such means that it is always X-ray mammogram and number 5 is MRI mammogram. So there is no study has shown that self-breast examination can decrease mortality but still we emphasize for self-breast examination because in our developing countries most of them don't know that there is one such thing called breast cancer. If they don't know the normal anatomy of breast, people cannot know what is breast cancer at all. So even though Western data does not show any advantage of self-breast examination, we, in our countries we have to emphasize this always. That is how we can pick up early diseases. Number two is clinical breast examination, which is done by a health physician like doctor, nurse, or if he's trained physician assistant. The sensitivity is around 60 percentage and specificity is around 94 percentage. So here also there is no randomized controlled trial uh, saying that clinical breast examination can improve survival but still we recommend for uh, clinical breast examination for young age because there is no exposure to radiotherapy and we can pick up early diseases. This is how this ACMG American College of Obstetric Genetics recommends. It should be done every one to three years for all ages between 30 to 39 years. Because before 40 years of age, it is not recommended to expose them to radiation from mammogram, eh? that is X-ray mammogram. That is how we emphasize on clinical examination. This ACS recommends we can start from 20 years also. Every three years we can do, and then after 40 years we have to do manually. So whenever a person comes, we have to see whether he is a Average risk. Average risk means they are general population. The other thing is high risk who have more chance of breast cancer in their lifetime than the general population. So there are various methods to see whether an individual comes under standard risk or a high risk. So there are various algorithms also. One such method is called the Gale model. So the, we, we, we use so many factors to see whether there is increased chance of breast cancer. So these are the people who are high risk, that is, they don't fit into a gender population because they have a more chance of breast cancer in the lifetime rather than a gender population. That is, past history of breast cancer, they can have a breast cancer in the opposite side or whenever they have a breast conservation, they can have local recurrence also. Other method is a gay model, which is ready in our postgraduate period. And there are so many uh, algorithms where we can input certain data of the patient and if it comes more than 20 percentage lifetime risk, they come under high risk. And history of radiotherapy in younger age will have a long term side effect of secondary malignancies. And the pedigree chart shows a multiple uh, history of breast cancer in the family. These are the calculators which I was mentioning before. So these are available for free, we can use any one of the above and we can input the data and if there is more than 20 percent, they come under high risk. So these are the other algorithms available free in the online, we can use any one of the above. So this is the very old model which is modified Gale model. So some of the parameters, these are the uh, common parameters which are used in the algorithm also, that is age of the patient 
younger the uh, more the age and more the chance of breast cancer, early menarche and uh, late childbirth, number of first degree relatives with uh, breast cancer, and past history of any uh, benign breast biopsies and atypical hyperplasia, and race also plays a vital role. So for average risk, clinical examination is recommended from the age of 25 to 40 years, the frequency of every 1 to 3 years. For women more than 40 years and older, annual clinical breast examination and also X-ray mammogram, it is what recommended. For high risk patients, which I was mentioning, that is more than 20 percent is lifetime risk, we have to start screening right from age of 18 years. From 18 years, we are not supposed to expose them to any scan. They, uh, they can be encouraged to do self breast examination and clinical breast examination. From 25 years onwards, they can be subjected to MRI at the interval of 6 to 12 months. From 30 years onwards, we can introduce mammogram. Mammogram, as such, always means that it is X ray mammogram. And it can be altered with MRI every 6 months so that we can pick up early breast cancers. So some parents about this X-ray mammogram, it is the single most modality which has shown to decrease mortality as per evidence. It has the advantage of low cost, low radiation, high sensitivity. So this is the most commonly used method of X-ray that is cranial caudal view and medial lateral view which tells most of the pathology in detail. So this is how uh, mammogram appears. Any radio dense opaque, which we'll be seeing in the subsequent pictures, we can pick up early. This is the common Bilex reporting system, which is used universally. There are seven categories. Category zero is incomplete. That is, the radiologist cannot tell what it is. So he needs further investigation to tell what is the category. And category one is, there is no abnormality at all. Category 2 is benign condition and the radiologist can very well tell that it is always benign and subsequent follow up will be like a normal general population. So these are the sum of benign pictures that is calcified for the rodinoma. We can have a vascular calcification and intranumbrate lymph node which can be seen in the X-ray mammogram. And category 3 where the radiologist is not clear whether it is really a malignant or a benign, this is the scenario where a physician should be very, very alert because whenever we are having a clinically suspicious heart lung and we are more in favor of malignancy and but the radiologist has reported uh, by X3, we are not supposed to leave the patient. We have to use our common sense to do biopsy because many times the, radi the validity of a radiologist may not be reliable, especially when we have a sonologist interpreting the mammogram so we should not entirely depend on the mammogram only. We should correlate like clinical examination and uh, physical this one mammogram as well as a pathology. So whenever we have a doubt, it's better to go for a biopsy. But if you are sure that it is not a, a clinically suspicious, we can we have two options. Either we can go for a six monthly follow up, or we can do a, a biopsy. Patient is not compliant. Category 4 is a suspicious of malignancy. We have 4A, 4B and 4C, three types. And it ranges from 2 to 95 percent is the chance of cancer. It is a very wide range. And again 4A is 2 to 10 percent, 4B is uh, 10 to 15 percent, 4C is 50 to 95 percent. And this is a classical picture of a malignant mass, which is irregular mass dense mass and the margin cannot be defined well. So we have a speculation that is irregular borders. This is a classical picture of a malignancy. So category 6 is already a biopsy proven uh, cancer where we are doing scan post biopsy. So all the trials have shown that there is a decrease in breast cancer rate from 10 to 25 percentage. Approximately one fourth of Breast cancer related deaths can be avoided if we are informing the general population to do regular screening. So there are various recommendations we could see. 
these are the various associations and their recommendations. So most of the things tell that either it can be every one year interval or every two years also if patient is very compliant. And when do we start screening? From the age of 40 years, there are some associations telling that we can start only from 50 years. But for our Indian scenario, it's better to start from 40 years only. Most of the malignancies are coming up in 40 to 50 years of age group, so that if you start by 50 years, we may miss most of the malignancies. That is why we have to adapt from the international recommendations. And from 50 years onwards, it is uh, compulsory. All of the associations are strongly recommend. About 70 years, again it comes according to general population. Most of the associations tell we have to screen at least up to 74 years of age. About 74 years, if patient is very fit and we are expecting more than 10 years of life expectancy and the patient is very fit, we can continue screening. There is no upper limit. So to summarize, screening mammogram is recommended from annually from 40 years. This is recommended for Indian scenario. There is only one association, it is telling from 50 years onwards. So coming to MRI, MRI should not be done as a routine. Only for high risk people we have to do because it is very, very sensitive so that the false positivity rate is very, very high. For if you do MRI, most of them will have some finding in all the reports. That is why we are not subject to MRI for all. So MRI is never a replacement for an extra mammogram. Breast MRI has never been compared directly for a general population, whether it has a survival benefit. So some of the common indications for MRI are people who have dense breast, for example in the age group of less than 40 years, where a mammogram cannot show a clear picture of the mass, we are supposed to do the MRI. And high risk people where we have expecting a malignancy at a younger age, we can start with MRI. And a patient with a first degree relative having a BRCA mutation or history of radiotherapy in a young age like Hodgkin lymphoma patients can be followed up with the MRI breast. And who have an approximately more than 20 percentage, as I mentioned earlier, if they are, if they are high risk, we have to use MRI because we are introducing screening in the younger age. So this sonar mammogram or ultrasound mammogram, it is never uh, recommended individually, only it is used as an adjunct. So suppose if for routine we have to use X-ray mammogram, if at all younger age we can use MRI. The sonogram it can be used only for comparison purpose or can be used for biopsy purpose. So this is a summary of all the recommendations. Clinical breast examination, though there is no strong evidence, but it is recommended from the age of 30 years. And ultrasound, it is always used as urgent, not as a single modality. And the X-ray mammogram, it is recommended from the age of 40 years. And MRI can be used for high-risk people. And people with less than 40 years, we can use MRI mammogram. So some of the problems are pain and small amount of radiation risk, but it is acceptable level only. And patient we can have false positive and false negative reports, and there can be a chance of overdiagnosis and up to 7 to 50 percentage of patients. So mammogram is the only screening modality which has proven survival benefit. Clinical breast examination should be encouraged in countries lacking screening and in developing countries. And MRI and ultrasound can be used only as an urgent for routine mammogram. For first step is breast self-examination, breast awareness should always be encouraged in our developing countries. The second one is cervical cancer. It is the third most common. And people who don't have access, it is still higher. The benefits are there is a cancer incidence has decreased by around 70 percentage with the introduction of screening in cervical cancer. We could see two-thirds of incidence has been reduced from 1950 onwards. Most commonly used are HPV screening and pap smear. Pap smear, as we all know, is scraping of cervical uh, surface. And other method of transport is liquid-based cytology. So this is a normal squamocolonar junction. As age increases, there is retraction of the squamocolonar junction to a higher above. This zone between the actual squamocolonar junction and the present squamocolonar junction. This 
intermediate zone is called the transition zone where the chance of malignancy is very very high. So this is the place we have to uh, suspect for cancers. So this is the routine uh, spe uh, speculum examination. And this is the spatula and uh, this brush cytology. So we are introducing a spatula and uh, putting a 360 degree rotation and taking this smear. And another is the brush cytology, we can use this also. So this is the interpretation of uh, report where high grade squamous intraopital in neoplasia, we have to subject them for further investigation in the form of uh, biopsy or uh, cystoscopy. And uh, colposcopy. This is the summary of recommendation for uh, cervical cancer screening. We have to start from the age of 21 years and up to 65 years it is recommended. From 21 to 30 years, HPV testing is not recommended. Why? Because most of them people will harbor some form of HPV infection which is self-limiting. So after 30 years there is, uh, most of the time people will have uh, resistance to HPV and it is not recommended to test for HPV between 21 to 30 years because high chance of false positivity can be there. For 21 to 29 years we have to use only cytology every 3 years. From 30 year onwards we have two options, either combined testing that is co-testing with cytology and HPV every 3 years or if you use single modality that is cytology it can be repeated once in 5 years. Almost all the associations recommend same, unlike breast. So the third one is the colorectal cancer. So we have to pick up early polyps so that it can, uh, we can pick up early malignancies. Th these are the three common polyps, hyperplastic polyp, SSP that is sicile serrated adenoma and then traditional serrated adenoma. So hyperplastic polyp is very very low malignant potential. Many people will have this hyperplastic polyp and we do not worry much about this. Whereas this sicile serrated and especially this traditional serrated adenoma, we have to follow up with subsequent colonoscopy because malignant potential is very, very significant. So these are the various uh, screening methods used for colon cancer like fecal occult blood test, colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy and the CT colonoscopy as well as sigmoidoscopy. So we could see the sensitivity of the colonoscopy. Even for a small 5 mm polyp, the sensitivity is very very high for colonoscopy. The more the size of the lesion, more the sensitivity. Whereas if you go by fecal occult blood, which is not a standard of care for colon cancer screening, so the sensitivity is very very low for small lesions. So that is why colonoscopy is always recommended. The other one is sigmoidoscopy. It is having a same sensitivity as like colonoscopy. We have other methods like fecal DNA testing. So this also has a very very low sensitivity. So the best recommended method is colonoscopy which should be repeated once in every 10 years. So from hyperproliferation to invasive cancer it takes around 15 years. So this 15 years is most precious. We can pick up very very early diseases. So average risk for general population Gender population means anybody who is more than 45 years and there is no past history of adenoma, no history of inflammatory bowel disease and they have a negative family history of uh, colorectal cancer or there is no high grade dysplasia and there is no more than a centimeter lesion and no villus or tubular villus histology. These are the average risk. For increasing the whoever has those negative history they are commanding, uh, coming under increased risk. So this is the recommendation for screening. So ideal is colonoscopy only. The other alternate option is sigmoidoscopy. Whenever it, these two are not possible, the other things can be followed rather than nothing at all. Because the, as we saw, the sensitivity is very very low for fecal immune testing or fecal occult test and DNA testing. All these have a very very low sensitivity, but it can be done as a very very basic procedure rather than invasive method and capsule colonoscopy which is a non-invasive method it is also recommended only as an adjunct where colonoscopy is not possible because of some severe cardiac problem or patient refusing for colonoscopy 
And CT colonography is also repeated every five years. So, recommendation is only colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. The other things are only used as the adjunct. So, this is how we have to follow up after a polpectomy. Anybody who are having more than 10 adenomas, they come under a very, very high risk. So, they have to be repeated for in another year for any malignancy for development. The other people who are having higher risk are any more 5 to 10 adenomas or 5 to 10 polyps, sisal serrated, or more than a centimeter polyp, or villus or tubulovillus histology or high grade dysplasia. These are the people who have to be repeated once in 3 years. So if we are incidentally seeing any polyp in the colonoscopy for, done for some other purpose, so we are supposed to follow up the patient, telling that patient can have a colorectal cancer in future. So fourth one is the prostate cancer, which is very, very common in men, I mean in the elderly people. So as the age increases, the chance of, we could see around 90% of people over age of 80 years will harbor prostate cancer. So this is the recommendation. Since beginning of prostate specific antigen, there is a decline in prostate cancer incidence by 40% and 75% reduction in proportion of advanced stage of cancer at diagnosis. So there are various controversies whether prostate cancer should really be screened because by screening we are almost picking up only a good variety of cancer. That is benign, slow growing prostate cancer. So there is a spurious improvement in survival. So there is always a controversy, but it is also recommended in a screening protocol because this study, prostate cancer screening trial showed 20% reduction in mortality, whereas another trial showed that there is no difference in mortality. Why? Because by screening prostate cancer, most of them we are picking up only a good variety of prostate cancer which is slow growing, which does not cause harm by itself. So if at all we are following screening protocol, we have to subject them for screening from the age of 50 years onwards up to at least age of 70 years. On more than 70 years, people with a good gender condition can also be followed up for screening. And every one to two years, they have to be tested. Always, we have to do digital rectal examination and PSA correlation only and not as a single modality. Any heart, prostate, mass or increase in PSA more than 3 or some literature say 4, we have to go for a biopsy or MRI. So, prostate uh, cancer recommendations are PSA screening does yield a survival benefit. PSA screening picks up cancers 5 to 7 years prior to symptomatic disease. And PSA screening may represent lower diagnosis in around 25 percentage of people. The last one is the costume of lung. So uh, this is for uh, only for smokers or past smokers, not for general population. We have to remember very well because we have to do CT scan for so many general population to protect one serial lung. So that is why it is not recommended for general population. So people who are aged between 25 and 80 years, and who have a pack year of 30 and above, and current smokers or people who have stopped smoking at least less than 15 years. That is. Up to 15 years, they still have the chance of cancer, even though patient has stopped smoking. That is why we have to follow up screening for next 15 years also, even after cessation of smoking. The recommendation is not a chest X-ray because it cannot pick up any mass, yearly masses. Recommendation is only CT, that is low dose CT. It can uh, reduce death by up to 20 percentage. So these are the various recommendations. Thank you very much for uh, your kind patience. Any questions can be welcome. For cancer screening of the cervix, it's too early, 21 years, you know. Because for you, they're not married most of them at that age. Uh, but this is uh, what the condition is. Because it is not for the cancer, no? just to pick up the early lesions, benign lesions like uh, uh, SIN 1, SIN 2, and 3. Because it takes another 10 to 15 years for invasive cancer to develop. Just we are intervening before only. And that too, HPV testing is not recommended because up to 21 to 30 years, most of them will have a HPV, this one, a HPV infection, which is transient in nature. And it will self-resolve by itself. 
So after 30 years, this HPV testing has to be done. Sir, so what about the vaccination? Yes. Vaccination definitely is 9 to 14 years. Okay. 9 to 14 years before the first sexual act. Up to 45 years it is recommended, but the younger the age, not a protective effect. Before the exposure to HPV, that is before the first sexual act, before, it was before marriage. So 9 to 14 years is ideal age, and 14 to 26 years is next uh, beneficial age, and above 26 to 45 also it is recommended, though the benefit may be slightly lesser than the younger age. How many doses? That is also 2 to 3 doses actually, generally. If you go for yearly between 9 to 14 years, 2 doses is fair enough, sir. But generally, most of them come up very late only, so 0, 1 and 6 month interval we have to give. 3 doses we have to give. And there also we have a nano so this is a 9th strain. After a very wonderful lunch, uh, uh, there is a bit of dozing off, but uh, I'll try to keep it as interesting as possible and uh, show you some movies as well, or so short videos. So uh, the topic of uh, my uh, talk today is going to be uh, minimally invasive colorectal surgery and proctology. Uh, where are we currently standing? What is the current status? Um, and uh, so uh, I'm Sandal Kumar Dhanapati, I'm a senior consultant in Apollo Proton. I've joined the uh, Proton uh, very recently. So what is minimally invasive surgery? So whenever we make a very small cut or a very small axis to reach a big area. Uh, for example, abdomen uh, had to be reached only with the very huge incisions from the xiphoid to the symphysis pubis in the past. But we can have the same uh, uh, exposure by introducing a small laparoscope through a 1 cm or even 5 mm incisions. So that is where we have progressed with the minimally invasive surgery. And it can be in the form of a, a uh, laparoscopic surgery or it can be in the form of robotic surgery or it can be in the form of single incision surgery which can either be laparoscopic or robotic. Uh, so what is uh, wrong with open surgery? There is nothing wrong with open surgery uh, but there are a lot of disadvantages with the open surgery. Uh, so the, the disadvantages can be one, a big incision which has a high risk of uh, getting infected the redness and the swelling in the, uh, in the wounds can uh, indicate the presence of infection and when it gets infected severely it can result in wound dehiscences like this and it can take a month or so to heal and uh, uh, these are the kind of scars some people can get after uh, big incisions and, uh, and uh, some people can develop a bulge as well or uh, what we call as the incisional hernias which has to be once again intervened uh, because of the complications that can happen because of the incisional hernias. So what are the advantages of uh, minimally invasive surgery? So uh, of course as I said smaller wounds, uh, the smaller the wound the less the pain uh, and less the pain the earlier is the discharge, earlier the discharge the early return to work and uh, whenever we make smaller incisions, there is less immunosuppression, uh, less wound infection, and uh, literally through uh, 5 mm or 10 mm port side wounds, there is literally no incisional hernias. So uh, that was about uh, minimally invasive uh, colorectal or GI surgery. So uh, what is the same in proctology? What is the same with the anal surgery? Uh, the anal wounds, why should we uh, attempt for a minimally invasive surgery in the anus? Because, uh, one, 
In the anus, the wounds are deliberately left open because they are exposed to the fetal material and the fetal material is full of bacteria. And if we close the wounds there, it is in invariably going to get infected and the sutures are going to fall apart. Uh, second thing, uh, wound in the anal region, pain can last for one, or one to three weeks because it has a very rich nerve supply. Um, uh, the time of work, even after a, a, a resection surgery like a, a colon cancer resection, people are fit to go back to work in about a week or ten days. But a person who had a file surgery cannot sit for fifteen days. So. Uh, uh, so the time of work, even though it is a, a, a more or less minor surgery, it gives a more time of work. Uh, fetal contamination of the wound is inevitable, staining of the undergarments because of the wounds in the anal area. And uh, uh, the pain is always more when the patient cannot see the wound. Uh, they don't know what's going on and they get worried. And of course, uh, uh, anal wounds uh, don't allow the patients to drive as well for a long period. So, uh, so hereafter I am going to show some uh, uh, videos to make you understand how we do this minimally invasive surgery for various cancers and non-cancerous problems in the gastrointestinal tract. So first is the cancer rectum, uh, what we call as the anterior resection. So this is a, a case of uh, uh, CA rectum where we are doing a uh, a laparoscopic surgery and uh, I have made into very very small clips because longer clips can make you bored. So uh, I will show only the so, important features. So that is the uh, IMA, the inferior mesenteric artery which supplies the tumors usually uh, and that is uh, getting clipped and uh, cut which is going to be the main vascular division uh, and uh, followed by the pelvic uh, a dissection with the laparoscopy, the pelvic dissection can go as deep as this, where you can see the bottom of the pelvis, almost the pelvic floor, and then uh, we do the splenic flexure mobilization as well, and then finally, uh, st circular stapler is inserted from uh, from the anus, and it is uh, connected to the uh, the colonic end after the resection, and a circular double stapled anastomosis is made, and. Uh, uh, the patient uh, goes home about five days after the surgery. So this is in short what an anterior resection is. Uh, and uh, why uh, we have been very successful in doing these anterior resections or cancer surgery very effectively is because of uh, there are certain steps which we have concentrated more on. So for example, uh, the splenic flexure mobilization in rectal surgery is an extremely important step. And that is what we are doing here. Uh, the splenic flexure is mobilized all the way from the pancreas. The superiorly you can see the pancreas and inferiorly it is the transverse mesocolon. And uh, you can see the spleen there as well. And uh, this forms the uh, complete uh, mobilization of the splenic flexure uh, when we totally disconnect it from the pancreas. And uh, because this colon, wherever we divide, it has to reach the bottom of the pelvis. So only a very good mobilization is going to make it reach to the bottom of the pelvis. It's usually uh, uh, the thing which results in failure is the tension in the anastomosis. So whenever we have to pull the colon to make an anastomosis, the tension, lack of vascularity is what it, uh, makes the surgery fail. If we do a good splenic flexure mobilization, it's almost, uh, uh, um, it, it, it's, a, uh, it, it's as good as a 100% success rate. So, um, and the next thing which um, we take more care of or more advancement recently is what we call as the interspectric dissection. See, uh, from the abdomen, we reach as far as the pelvic floor. So, this is the pelvic floor muscle, that is the levator anime muscle. We never used to see the muscles so clearly in open surgery. In open surgery, we, we can see nothing of this. So in laparoscopic surgery, we put the camera deep into the pelvis and we are able to see the pelvic floor muscle, the levator anime muscle. And then we proceed with the uh, dissection. The interspintric dissection means, for example, when the tumor is very low in the rectum. 
like uh, it is at the inner rectal junction or one or two centimeters above the inner rectal junction, all these patients have to have a full abdominal perineal excision in the past, which resulted in a permanent stoma for the patient. But uh, but what we can do now is so we dissect up to the pelvic floor and even beyond the pelvic floor. See, uh, here we are going through the pelvic floor muscle and going into the intersphincteric space because the levator ani continues as the external sphincter and the muscle in the wall of the bowel will continue as the internal sphincter and if we go in between these two layers, we can uh, definitely get below the tumor. So that is, that is the kind of view we get. This is the intersphincteric space which used to be viewed only from below in the past but we can view it from above as well. Uh, so that is where we go down into the intersphincteric space and then what gets done after that is we have come up to the intersphincteric space from above itself. So from below, uh, this is a special retractor called as a Lone Star Retractor. Uh, so we use this for the anal uh, dissection where uh, we divide the tumor. We know exactly where the tumor is. We go one centimeter or even two centimeters beyond the tumor and then cut so that we are 100% sure about the margins and then deliver the mobilized bowel from above uh, and uh, we cut the uh, colon uh, for a good clearance and then final anastomosis is made uh, uh, from the anus itself. So, so this is the lowest possible anastomosis we do and that is how uh, uh, upper rectal cancers, mid rectal cancers don't need never, I mean they don't need permanent stroma but low rectal cancers, very low rectal cancers were having a permanent stoma uh, even 10 years back. But in the last 10 years, we have improved on that and this patient will have only a temporary ileostomy to protect and after two months, the temporary ileostomy will also be reversed and the patient will be completely back to normal. Uh, so, uh, uh, that was an anastomosis from below and here I am showing a case where we can uh, do an anastomosis from above itself. Uh, so this tumor was just one centimeter above the previous patient's tumor. And uh, what we do is we go as far as that. And uh, here uh, we are putting a stapler just above the pelvic floor muscle, just above the levator eye. Uh, I'm doing two firings in order to completely divide the rectum there. It's almost a vein or rectal junction. You can see how deep in the pelvis uh, I have made that. And then once again, the circular stapler angle comes from uh, below and then we connect this and make a... So this is where the mobility is important. So it has to reach down into the pelvis. That is where uh, it has to uh, reach without any tension at all. So if it reaches without, uh, I mean, uh, with, uh, without any tension, then surgeon need not have any tension in the post-operative period. So we finally do an air leak test and uh, uh, put a drain in the end. Uh, so uh, this is the publication I did uh, uh, from Gen Hospital, that was my previous hospital, where it was an experience over a thousand cases of laparoscopic anterior resection. So it consists of high anterior resection, low anterior resection, ultra low anterior resection was the one uh, you saw and then the colorenal anastomosis is the one where uh, we made the anastomosis from below. So uh, uh, when I presented this in the uh, uh, ACRSI, that is the National Colorectal Conference in Calcutta, that I was awarded with the uh, first prize as well um, regarding the improvements that we have made uh, recently. So parastomal hernia, uh, I'm showing you a video of the uh, uh, laparoscopic repair uh, I performed and this is a patient who unfortunately had to have an abdominal perineal excision that is a complete removal of the rectum as well as the anus and this patient has a permanent stoma and one of the pro problems of having a permanent stoma is the parastomal hernia so and this is the parastomal hernia that the patient has been having so we don't operate on all parastomal hernias because anybody who has a stoma will have some degree of a parastomal hernia. Uh, but when it reaches this size, the problems are, uh, heaviness feeling is always there for the patient, and the stoma bag doesn't seat well over this mountain. And, uh, 
and uh, the leakages happen often and they can't go out of the house and, and uh, uh, it, it severely affects the lifestyle of the patient. So when the parastomal hernia goes to this level, it has to be operated. So, uh, so uh, this is the operation of the, uh, the surgeons and myself standing the right side of the patient. So all the uh, parts of the operation here will be carried out from just that one, one, uh, uh, one position there. So you can see uh, how. So the ports, these are the only uh, wounds that have been made on top of the abdomen. One 10 mm port in the, left, uh, in the right upper quadrant for the camera and two working 5 mm ports uh, on either side of the camera port. Right hand working port, left hand working port. So we, uh, and this is the view I get immediately after going inside the abdominal cavity. This patient luckily had a uh, laparoscopic abdominal perineal so literally no other additions apart from the uh, hernia is there. Um, so that is where the lots of momentum have gone and uh, got incarcerated into the parastomal hernial sac. So we have to slowly reduce all that uh, momentum which have been uh, uh, caught within the hernial sac. So uh, uh, the reduction of this momentum will need pressure from above as well. Uh, we need experienced sisters who can provide and that is uh, some of the bowel which was caught within the hernia uh, that is being uh, uh, released as well. So you can imagine with all so much of momentum and bowel caught, uh, how much uh, symptomatic it would have been for the patient and lots of additions also uh, need to be uh, released and after uh, releasing all the additions and all the incarcerated momental fat then we, uh, uh, we, we just, uh, just you can just pause here just, okay that's alright it has gone here so, um, so we just need to have the uh, hernial sac with just the one loop of large bowel which is going as the stoma. So that is the amount of dissection we have to do. Um, and then I'm are being released and uh, <coughs> so this is uh, half the operation being done uh, and then uh, we need a, a large space because this just by closing the defect of this uh, hernia will come back again so we have to close off the defect and using a, a special barbed suture uh, made of proline and I am measuring uh, with a tape regarding how much big mesh I need to use in order to cover the defect. Because this parastomal hernia is, uh, uh, is, uh, is something that recurs quite often. So we have to make sure that we do a very good repair, uh, place a nice mesh and there should not be any gap in between the loop exiting. It should not be too tight otherwise the bowel doesn't function. If it is too loose, then the hernia goes back inside. So here, um, uh, so the hole in the mesh has to be perfect. That fits only the bowel loop, which is exiting to go as the stone. So all this was done through those three uh, port holes. So this is a case of uh, 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 ulcerative colitis. This is a, a, a normal and IBD uh, patient. Uh, who had such a severe IBD not responding to medical management that, that this patient needed a total proctocolectomy. So, um, this was also planned laparoscopically. So, that is the sigmoid colon that I am holding up. Uh, 
and uh, starting with mobilization of the sigmoid colon from the lateral area. So all the lateral attachments of the sigmoid colon being released to the hormonic and going all the way up to the splenic flexure of the uh, of the colon. So this uh, severe inflammatory bowel disease has a typical appearance of a uh, rigid, uh, uh, rigid tube-like uh, uh, large intestine. That the stomach you can see superiorly. That is where we are dividing the transverse mesocolon, and here we are going into the rectum. This was, this is not a cancer surgery, so we are not being very radical with the rectum. Uh, and then further mobilization of the right colon is being done um, in the intraperitoneal place. So uh, because this is a total proctocolectomy with uh, uh, removal of the entire colon, right side, left side, so that's the right colon being retracted medially and the final attachments to the lateral abdominal wall being uh, released. And uh, finally all the mental attachments are also being released to completely release the colon and that is where uh, the rectum and this was a very thin patient and uh, that is the anorectal junction or reach from above and uh, the rectum is being uh, divided at the anorectal junction with the circular stapler as we have seen. A small opening is made in the suprapubic region in order to deliver the completely mobilized colon. And this is the typical appearance we get with acute severe ulcerative colitis. This is not the uh, normal way the colon looks. It is a bit more rigid and uh, we, uh, uh, we do a pouch uh, using the distal small bowel. This is uh, a pouch will be made and the pouch anal anastomosis is constructed at the end. So here a pouch, what we call as a J pouch is made in the small bowel and a final anastomosis is made with a circular stapler to the to the anal canal. So this is a pouch anal anastomosis and always uh, when we do a pouch anal anastomosis because it's a very very low anastomosis with high risk of leak, always um, uh, we defunction with an ileostomy and that is what I've done here, uh, defunctioning loop ileostomy in the right side of the abdomen. So the, the, this is the suprapubic wound which I have made for uh, removing the specimen out and uh, this is a 10 mm port uh, for the camera. This is a 12 mm port uh, for the stapler to go in. Um, uh, so these are, these are the only wounds that we have made to do such an extensive surgery on the inside. So patient uh, recovers quite well and then the, this patient went home on the fifth post operative. So uh, this was selected as the best video in the uh, national conference as well. Um, so, I'm going to a next area where uh, laparoscopic surgery is very useful for the patient. This is a patient with a rectal prolapse. So, rectal prolapse patients need a uh, rectopexy. And uh, one of the best uh, results is offered by uh, mesh rectopexy, which can either be done posteriorly or anteriorly. This is a case of uh, rectal prolapse. You can typically see the big cuddly sacs with these rectal prolapse patients. Here we have to mobilize the, uh, uh, the rectum and the attachments of the rectum which have become quite loose and that's why, that's why uh, rectum has prolapsed out. So all the posterior attachments, uh, so it is uh, dissected in the mesorectal plane taking care uh, not to injure the nerves, the hypogastric nerves uh, and uh, the rectum is completely mobilized. Here the rectum is mobilized from the left hand side dividing the peritoneum. So this is all mobilized to pull the rectum up and then place the mesh posteriorly and fix the mesh with the sacrum and that is what uh, we are doing here. So the uh, proline mesh is placed uh, posteriorly and first the mesh is fixed to the sacral bone with some proline sutures. Then after that, uh, the uh, mesh will be fixed to the rectum uh, on the mesorectal fat joining the rectum. Here, at most care has to be taken that we don't injure or we don't go through the needle into the rectal lumen because even a little bit of fe fecal contamination is uh, going to cause failure of the surgery. It can cause an abscess uh, in the extraperitoneal space. And after placing the mesh and fixing the mesh, 
finally, we close off the extra peritoneal space. And uh, finally, we should, we should not see any part of the mesh at the end because a uh, proline mesh that is exposed to the abdominal cavity, can, uh, the bowel, uh, small bowel can go and get stuck to that and cause complications. So this posterior mesh rectopexy, the success of that has been uh, uh, documented in the males and I published that in the Journal of Minimal Access Surgery uh, just a couple of years ago. I'm showing you this uh, just to show how, how even a very complicated uh, uh, problems like a colorecycle fistula can be dealt with by laparoscopic surgery. Uh, so these are the ports placed. Uh, so that is where we can see the sigmoid colon being adherent to the anterior abdominal wall that is uh, being released. Uh, from the adhesions. These are some of them are inflammatory adhesions as well because of the presence of colorocycle fistula and uh, um, the retroperitoneal plane is also dissected because uh, we have to uh, remove the sigmoid colon. Usually the pathology here is a diverticular disease of the sigmoid colon that uh, ends up and the fistula is into the bladder when it uh, gets stuck anteriorly along with the bladder. So this is the fistula site which is being uh, divided anteriorly, it is the uh, urinary bladder and posteriorly it is the sigmoid colon and this is where uh, you can see all the granulation tissue and you can see that uh, lumen kind of thing. So that is the fistula site uh, and uh, uh, all the lesions being uh, completely released. We have to do a, a remaining uh, mobilization of the sigmoid colon also and uh, divide the uh, sigmoid colon at the rectosigmoid junction and remove the complete uh, uh, sigmoid colon because uh, if we leave the sigmoid colon this is going to wreck our back. And what do we do with the defect in the bladder? So we have to uh, remove all the granulation tissue and then suture of the defect and leave the uh, urinary catheter in place for two weeks and that was sort of the problem as uh, uh, we did before with the anterior resection. Once again, a circular staple anastomosis is done. Finally, a drain is placed, and then momentum is placed there to protect, and that is the specimen we have got. That is the site of the uh, fistula from the inside of the colon. So, that was all about uh, colorectal surgery. Uh, so, uh, we will just see some uh, proctology as well. So, uh, panting of the hemorrhoids is quite commonly performed at the outpatient clinic itself uh, and uh, uh, minimally invasive procedures uh, will start with, the, with this banding where uh, so instead of doing a big hemorrhoid activity. Sorry, sorry. why is For the very early stage piles. Post procedure So for the for a very early stage piles, that is the best thing, because if it hasn't prolapsed uh, in, uh, enough to uh, do a hemorrhoidectomy, we can very well do a banding and do a minimally invasive procedure. So, but however, for the piles which has prolapsed, the third degree piles just come out of the uh, anal canal, so we can do a hemorrhoidectomy. Uh, so the hemorrhoidectomy, uh, during my PG days uh, uh, in the Madras Medical College, 
uh, we almost uh, uh, never could identify the actual anatomy because we used to have only the scissors, knife, and the uppermost uh, uh, electrocautery. Um, but there was a lot of blood and we couldn't identify the planes. So here we can, you could see that uh, I'm performing a hemorrhoidectomy uh, with a hormonic scalpel. Absolutely, there is no blood there at all. And even at the end of the procedure, it will, uh, the total amount of bleeding would have been at the most two or three drops. So ligating the pedicle of the hemorrhoid and then cutting off the hemorrhoid from the pedicle. So that the same thing is done for the 7 o'clock pile mass. So the big advantage of having a bloodless field of surgery is we, we, we can go in the exact plane where we want to and uh, we can preserve the, easily the sphincter muscles. We can see them, preserve them uh, and uh, uh, without any blood loss it helps the patient as well. So that is the 11 o'clock pile mass uh, being removed, the pedicle being ligated. This kind of hemorrhoidectomy is, uh, is, is almost a uh, uh, bloodless surgery. So, similar to uh, 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 the, using the harmonic, we can use the liver show as well for uh, doing hemorrhoidectomies. That is not playing. Sound is coming, but uh, really. Uh, Next. Okay, so the ligature is quite similar to the uh, uh, thing which we uh, do, from a more vascular piles, more fleshy piles, where we have a higher risk of bleeding during the surgery. I use a ligature, uh, and uh, that helps us uh, do the complete hemorrhoidectomy without a, uh, with a, uh, not more than a few drops of blood once again. Uh, unfortunately, I am unable to show because it is, uh, it is jumping. Uh, play for Okay, so this is a case of uh, using the laser for hemorrhoid. This is the second degree uh, prior mass where the patient came uh, not responding to medical management and the patient specifically requests, please do laser surgery for me for the pipes. Uh, so uh, we uh, survey the hemorrhoids all around and uh, the first step we do for a laser hemorrhoidal pexy is uh, I'm ligating the hemorrhoidal vessel that feeds into the 7 o'clock pile mass here. This is called as the uh, ligation of the hemorrhoidal artery. So first step is ligation of the hemorrhoidal artery. Um, that will be followed by inserting the laser probe into the hemorrhoid. So this is one place where uh, we don't make any cut in the anal area. So hemorrhoid artery is uh, ligated and then the, uh, the probe, the uh, laser probe is inserted and uh, the tip of the laser probe is placed uh, in the hemorrhoidal uh, uh, mass there and then uh, uh, the laser is activated, laser energy is activated and we are not able to see this clearly there but when we look closely, um, uh, about 40% shrinkage of this pile mass happens on the table itself. Uh, and then uh, immediately after uh, applying the piles, which generates a lot of uh, uh, heat, um, we apply the ice and uh, cool it off. So 
this is another minimalism in Basel. No, no wound made, but the hemorrhoid is being addressed. Complex amyl fistula can be a big problem for uh, all the surgeons. Uh, so this is a fistula where um, that there is an external opening at a 12 o'clock position. It's at the base of the scrotum. This is the base of the scrotum. And then uh, uh, you can see how the tract is going. So I'm injecting hydrogen peroxide here. And rather than opening, going straight into the anal canal, it goes takes all the way around and then goes there and opens inside the anal, uh, anal uh, cavity there. So uh, I made an incision right at the anal verge. Uh, curvilinear incision and uh, I had to in order to identify the fistula tract and then ligated the fistula tract and then I'm dividing in between the ligatures. Uh, this is called as the ligation of intersphincteric fistula tract. Once again this classifies as a minimally invasive uh, surgery because uh, we don't do a full fistulotomy where we cut the sphincter. So here uh, we get the result immediately where uh, when I inject hydrogen peroxide, it doesn't come into the internal opening, but rather comes where I have divided the uh, fistula tract. Because on this area, I have ligated the fistula tract. So this is what I expect. This is what uh, says that uh, uh, the result is good. Large rectal polyp. So uh, this is a very large rectal polyp. Uh, which you can see uh, that uh, uh, it's, it's a huge polyp. So uh, in, in the past, for example, 20 years back, uh, for these kind of rectal polyps, it's invariably it was an abdominal perineal excision because we don't know whether uh, this uh, large polyp will harbor any malignancy. Uh, so they end up with a permanent stoma. So what we do now is we use this lone star retractor to retract the anus on all sides and then expose the polyp and uh, feel the polyp to see exactly where the base of the polyp is, where it is attached to the uh, lower rectal wall and then injecting some saline to lift off the polyp from the mucosa and then uh, we have to be very patient in these kind of procedures so we have to uh, cut each and every part of the polyp use the energy source here uh, the harmonic is being used. Once again, uh, using all these energy sources and keeping a bloodless field helps us a lot in uh, going in the correct planes for the surgery. See, if it was fully full of blood, then you know we lose patients and, uh, uh, and <coughs> go in the wrong place. So more polyp tissue is being cut. It's almost it takes more, more than an hour. It looks like a very simple thing, but it will take more than an hour <coughs> in order to remove it completely. And you can see how good it looks at the end of the surgery. There is uh, some uh, lower rectal defect being uh, created there, but finally we will uh, suture all that. That is the complete for last part of the polyp being excised <coughs> using the harmonic. <coughs> and luckily this turned out to be a benign polyp as well without any focus of malignancy inside. So the complete base was around the uh, around two to five o'clock position. <coughs> Finally, the defect will be sutured. The mucosal defect is getting sutured with the PDS material. Even if we see a little bit of residual, we have to cut it out. So all these 
to attract us, we have to use to get a good exposure. Here in these kind of surgeries, the exposure is the most important part. We get the correct exposure. So after removing such a huge polyp, but this is the mood that we have, which heals well and the patient was discharged. The most important thing is we shouldn't allow the patient to get constipated and strain at passing motion. So otherwise it heals. So just finally looking for any residual. And finally this is how it looks with a small dressing. So uh, how far have you reached? Where are we standing with the minimally invasive surgery for colorectal and proctology? We, uh, we have gone quite uh, a way up. Uh, but still there is uh, some more heights that we can reach in the future. So we will aim for reaching uh, more heights. So this was about uh, 14,000 feet uh, where I went about uh, three years back. So next time we are aiming to reach even on top of this. Thank you very much for patiently listening. Any questions to the speaker? And then I have to uh, do the uh, uh, acknowledgement because I've just joined. The uh, chose for today is neuro interventions. Uh, we are, I'm going to talk about two topics. One is mechanical thrombectomy. The other one is uh, carotid artery, uh, balloon angioplasty and stenting. And this is only targeted at large vessel ischemic strokes. And the other one is a deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. I'll try to make it short so that we can have more of an interactive session rather than me going on and on. his family. Now things are much better. There is a procedure called thrombolysis which many of you would be doing, many physicians would be doing in your hospital wherein if the patient presents within 4.5 hours of an ischemic stroke, we can give a tissue plasmogen activator and try to lyse the clot. But this happens only for very small vessel strokes. Large vessel strokes like the internal carotid artery the middle cerebral artery, such big clots may not be lysed all the time because we cannot go beyond the limit in the dosing of the tissue plasminogen activator. So what do we do? There is a technique called the mechanical thrombectomy where we put a catheter inside the artery and try to retrieve the clot. So let us go into that. Next slide. So it's an advanced and a minimally invasive procedure called mechanical thrombectomy. And as I said, it's all about ischemic stroke and the blood clot in the brain. Basically, this, this is, uh, the goal is to create an awareness about this procedure, its benefits and what to expect during the treatment process. Next slide. So timely restoration, uh, you all would have known uh, the concept of uh, time, uh, time is brain, brain is time. Timely restoration of the cerebral blood flow using a reperfusion therapy is the most effective maneuver for salvaging the ischemic brain tissue that is not already infected. So we all know the umbra and the penumbra. Basically, we are trying to give life to the penumbra. There is a narrow window during which this can be accomplished since the benefit of reperfusion decreases over time. Initially, when the procedure started, we were offering this to people who presented within six hours of stroke. But then after 2018, there were newer trials and newer investigative modalities like the MR perfusion and all that. And the time limit has been increased to around 24 hours after a large vessel stroke. Next slide. 
So if a patient qualifies for a mechanical thrombectomy, the first step of the procedure is a groin puncture, which should occur within six hours of symptom onset, which is still the best possible outcomes that can be given. But as I said, if the perfusion to the area is intact to some extent, this time window has been increased to 24 hours. A, a specially designed clot removal uh, device is inserted through a catheter into the blocked artery to remove the clot. This involves placing a catheter into an artery at the from the femoral artery. Generally, we, we prefer femoral, but the radar can also be tried and advanced up to the location of the blockage. So, using we do this procedure in the cath lab. A stent retriever or an aspirator is inserted into the catheter. The stent reaches to a point beyond the clot, expands to stretch the walls of the artery and is finally pulled back or retreat which removes the clot or if it's a clot aspirator, the clot can be aspirated. So the removal of the clot should result in restoration of blood flow in the vessel and reverse the temporary injury caused to the brain. So what are the contraindications? Coagulopathy, current or a recent history of intracranial hemorrhage, recent head trauma, allergy to the contrast, severe sustained hypertension, endocarditis or some of the contraindications. Complications, we can have a groin hematoma, especially when we traumatize the patient and then proceed to mechanical thrombectomy, vessel dissection. Post-procedural, the most common thing is reperfusion injury. Though I say large vessel strokes, we don't go around offering the procedure for all large vessel strokes. There are strict criteria to select the patients because sometimes uh, it's like there is a black in the waterway, you remove the uh, block and then it results in gush of water to that particular area. So that is what happens here too. So that is what happens here too. You remove the clot, there is gush of blood into the infarcted area and sometimes that can do more damage to the patient rather than help the patient resulting in reperfusion injury. So limitations, uh, first only an estimated 10% of patients with acute ischemic stroke have a proximal large artery occlusion in the anterior circulation and present early enough to qualify for MT within 24 hours while approximately 9% of patients presenting in the 6 to 24 hour time window may qualify for MT. Second, only a few stroke centers have sufficient resources and expertise to deliver this therapy. However, eligible patients to re should receive standard treatment with intravenous thrombolysis if they present to hospitals where thrombectomy is not an option and those with qualifying anterior circulation strokes from large artery occlusion should then be transferred if at all possible to tertiary stroke centers in which intra-arterial thrombectomy is available, a strategy called a drip and ship. But this we don't really see happening. In a large, in, in majority of the places, uh, either patients don't get thrombolyzed at all or they get thrombolyzed and then managed cons conservatively. Majority of the population is not even aware that post thrombolysis there is a procedure called mechanical thrombectomy which can lead to improvement in power for the patient. A patient who is disdained to be bedridden lifelong has a chance to use his limbs over a period of time. So these are the uh, new trials that came in 2018 which uh, made uh, uh, the scope for the procedure became more because the time window also became from 6 hours to 24 hours. Because one thing is, one challenge that we face is the procedure is also a little expensive because the catheters used for the procedures are expensive per se and this cannot be achieved by a single consultant. It's a teamwork. It starts from the ER, from the ER medical officer, the consultant neurologist, the interventional neuroradiologist and sometimes if things go wrong, intervention by a neurosurgeon. Uh, and, uh, and if you pressurize a patient who, a patient attended who is not even aware of all these things and you tell them to make up their mind and give a consent for mechanical thrombectomy, things are not easy, especially sitting at a tertiary care center where they think you are out to grab the money. So the bad trial and the diffuse trial came in 2018 and made things a little easy and the number of patients uh, who could get benefited also became a little bit more.
So, key points. Firstly, educate the patients that the procedure is time sensitive and should be performed as soon as possible after the onset of stroke symptoms. The, though the, uh, the time window is 24 hours, the earlier we perform, the better outcomes we can give. Secondly, patients should be aware of the potential risks and complications associated with mechanical thrombectomy. On one side, yes, the patient can walk after a period of three months or one year, but uh, the cons are there is a chance of reperfusion injury also resulting in hemorrhagic transformation of the infarct. Thirdly, patients should understand the benefits of mechanical thrombectomy. It has shown to significantly improve outcomes for patients with acute ischemic stroke, particularly the large vessel occlusions. Lastly, patients should be informed about the recovery process after mechanical thrombectomy. The other thing is, uh, patients as well as attenders tend to think that immediately post thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy, the patient will be able to walk. No, that's not how it works. You are only clearing the artery and facilitating better perfusion for the infarcted area. Again, patient requires neuro rehabilitation to achieve a power of at least 3 by 5. So what is the point in doing this? That is what you would ask me. So the advantage is, if not for this, patients would still remind us 0 by 5, lifelong. So if this happens in a 60 year old, okay. But then now we are seeing increasing number of young strokes with the risk factors of diabetes, hypertension, smoking, drugs, lifestyle changes. So do you want someone who is only at 30 and 40 to remain bedridden for life? No, right? So this, uh, there need to be awareness about it among both the medical population so that such patients get referred at the right time as well as among the general public. So it's an important procedure for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke and as I said, the main thing is it's time sensitive. And it's a game changing intervention in acute ischemic stroke management. As I said earlier, we were only giving echosprin and atovostatin, treating the BP and the sugar and then just referring them to the physiotherapist. But then with, with such new techniques and mechanical thrombectomy also when it came, the procedure had a lot of complications. But over the last 20 years, a lot of innovation has happened in the catheter modification so that it's comparatively easier for the intervention person to do as well as give better outcomes with less complications. Uh, the next procedure is a keratid balloon angioplasty and a stenting technique. Uh, as mechanical thrombectomy is an acute procedure. Now keratid balloon angioplasty, if we have a clot, we can go do a mechanical thrombectomy. But a lot of times it can be thick atherosclerotic plaques which cannot be removed by mechanical thrombectomy. So this procedure does not happen in the acute setting. Once you have a, a stroke patient, you treat them for the small vessel stroke and during the evaluation when you do a keratid vertebral uh, Doppler for the neck or an MR angiogram of the neck, you, form, you find out there are very big blocks in the keratid artery. It's like instead of 100 percentage blood flow, there's only some 10 to 20 percentage happening. And a chip of this actually went on to cause a distal occlusion resulting in a smaller stroke. You end up treating the smaller stroke, but is the patient going to be okay only with a secondary prevention of echosprin and atovostatin? No, because that particular medication would not be enough to prevent future strokes. So that's when keratin balloon angioplasty happens. We are all familiar with coronary angioplasty, but uh, the amount of coronary, uh, the amount of awareness that we have about uh, coronary angioplasty we do not have about keratid angioplasty. So generally these procedures are done uh, say two weeks after an acute stroke. It can be done any time after two weeks but the earliest that it can be done is two weeks after an acute stroke. So it treats the blockages that usually occur because of atherosclerosis. And when the blockages occur, blood flow decreases and the organs or muscles that the artery supplies do not get enough oxygen or nutrients. It, and atherosclerosis can happen anywhere. Like if it happens in the peripheral blood vessels, we end up having a peripheral vascular disease. If it happens in the uh, keratin, we end up having a stroke. So what do we do? Earlier it was only balloon angioplasty. 
We went and put the stent and then uh, inflated the balloon over the occlusion, resulting in a balloon angioplasty. But what we saw after a period of time was the occlusion again came back. So for the artery to remain patent, we put in the catheter, we inflate the balloon and then we also put in a stent so that there is no re-occlusion of the large blood vessel because essentially the risk factors of hypertension, dyslipidemia and diabetes are still persistent in the patient. So it's a minimally invasive procedure used to treat carotid artery disease. A catheter with a deflated balloon is inserted into the artery. The balloon is then inflated which pushes the plaque against the artery walls and opens up the artery. Stamping is a procedure again used to treat the same. It's a small metal mesh tube that is inserted into the artery to hold it open. It improves the blood flow to the brain. Stamping is often used in combination with the balloon angioplasty. Uh, Basically, again, the catheter is through the femoral. You expand the stent, you do a balloon angioplasty. It's, it's the same content but in a picturesque form. And how the procedure can be done. Indication. So, who do we offer this to? So, any symptomatic patient. In symptomatic patient, by that I mean either patient has already presented with a stroke or a TIA and more than 50% stenosis in them. But there can also be asymptomatic patients with more than 70% stenosis of the carotid artery. Patient does not have any CVA symptoms, but you end up doing the procedure uh, for some other problem like giddiness or a vague headache, but you see that the patient has 70% stenosis. Just because the patient does not have any neurological complaint at present, it's not okay just to put them on conservative management. Asymptomatic patients with more than 70% stenosis and symptomatic patients with more than 50% stenosis, we should definitely offer them carotid balloon angioplasty and stenting. Now earlier, this was a later technique. Earlier, just like bypass for heart, we used to do keratin and arthritis. And in initial stages when they did trials, they found out that the keratid endarthrectomy was superior to the keratid stenting. But then over the years, stenting techniques and the catheters used have become very, very sophisticated, resulting in near equal results. And the contraindication, uh, uh, sorry, the indications high risk, high surgical risk patients. Like for example, we may not be able to offer keratid endarthrectomy for a lot of patients like ones with severe pulmonary disease, recent MI, prior neck radiation for a head and neck cancer, severe congestive heart failure, presence of a tracheostomy or a contralateral ochre cord damage. So these patients are not uh, uh, good candidates for keratid endarthrectomy. So you think the patient requires a keratid endarthrectomy but may not undergo, but may not be in a position to undergo that, then this can be offered as an alternative. And previous keratid endarthrectomy with re stenosis we could have all heard uh, cardiac bypass patients having a re stenosis resulting in recurrent MI. So the same can happen here also. So you don't, once you've done a bypass, you cannot again go and do a bypass. So you can do stenting in the bypassed vessel. <coughs> Conditions associated with increased procedural risk and the contraindications for keratid artery stenting. So increased risk or age more than 80 years, symptomatic ICA lesion, severe renal insufficiency and tricky aortic arch anatomy, tortuous uh, common carotid or the internal carotid artery and a long subtotal ICA occlusion, poor femoral access, major stroke within 4 to 6 weeks. As I said, this was earlier but now we are offering it even after 2 weeks of a recent stroke and an extensive intracranial microvascular disease, we call them uh, ICAD, which is actually intracranial uh, uh, atherosclerotic disease. The contraindications are intolerance to aspirin and clopidogrel because once you put in a stent, they definitely require double antiplatelets for a long period of time. So contraindications, if the patient is intolerant to aspirin or clopidogrel, putting a stent will only result in a restenosis of a stent over a period of time. Circumferential IC occlusion because it would be very difficult for us to pass in the stun, the stent. Then intraluminal thrombus. If there is a floating thrombus, we won't be doing this. And then an intracranial aneurysm or an AVM requiring treatment. So these are some of the contraindications for the keratid artery stenting procedure. So patients undergoing keratid artery stenting are commonly pre-treated with aspirin and 
clopidogrel. Aspirin can be continued lifelong as we all know. Clopidogrel at least for a minimum period of one month. The concept of dual antiplatelet therapy came from the coronary experience and was immediately embraced by part of the interventional community also for the endovascular treatment of the keratid arteries. Small randomized trials comparing single to double antiplatelet therapy for keratid artery strengthening followed but had to be prematurely terminated due to high stent thrombosis and neurological event rates in the aspirin only group. Anticoagulation commonly with unfractionated apparel is limited only at the time of the procedure. Patients need not be put on anticoagulants post procedure. Antiplatelets would suffice. Again, this is just a pictorial representation of the uh, stent placement. So we also put in a basket at the end so that when we are doing a procedure, we do not want a distal occlusion resulting in a new stroke during the procedure. So the balloon that is inflated there would prevent a distal passing of the atherosclerotic plaque. So keratin balloon angioplasty and stenting are alternative techniques for keratin revascularization in patients with keratin artery stenosis who are at high surgical risk for endarterectomy. Though keratin endarterectomy is the established treatment standard for keratin revascularization, of late this has become uh, a more uh, easier and an approachable procedure and, we, and is being offered more. In terms of procedural safety, a study found that pre-dilatation of the keratid artery using an adequate diameter balloon in patients undergoing angioplasty was safe and did not result in complications. If the study included symptomatic patients with significant keratid stenosis and asymptomatic patients with severe keratid stenosis. The use of an adequate diameter balloon for pre-dilatation before stenting was reported in all cases. Advantages of the procedure compared to a keratin endarterectomy are shorter duration of hospital stay, interventional procedure compared to a surgical pro procedure. So when you say that patients invariably opt for a stenting procedure rather than a, proce a bypass procedure and the results are near equal to keratin endarterectomy nowadays and the maximum hospital stay, if you look into it, it's hardly only 4 days. Questions to the speaker? Good evening, I'm not present here. I thank Kayane for offering me this opportunity uh, in front of so many seniors here. So, I will be uh, talking about uh, multiple myeloma. Uh, it's a great topic, like, so, but it will result the, those kind of patients will be uh, faced in day-to-day uh, -day, uh, practices for many orthopedicians and uh, nephrologists. So I have to, uh, taken up this topic. I just uh, make it superficial so that the patient will be. So multiple myeloma, as we all know, is a disease of elderly. Usually the median age of uh, incidence was around uh, 60 to 70 years. But nowadays we see many patients who have uh, been presenting with, uh, presenting with or diagnosed with myeloma at the age of 40 to 50 years also. So incidence of age has, reduced, has been reduced now. So it is a chronic disease. So it is a chronic disease. So the treatment of multiple myeloma will be going on and on for the patient. So uh, it is like when it is symptomatic, uh, we also know about the other treatment related uh, in the myeloma spectrum that MGUS and small myeloma. I'll be uh, talking about it in the next slide. So initially symptomatic, the patient will be relapse free for some time and after a period of maybe uh, some uh, three to four years, the patient again presents with symptoms and it goes on and on so, uh, so far like that. And we have multiple lines of management also for that. And after every line of management, the duration of the of their, uh, sorry, life expectancy diseases with the subsequent management. So we all know about the slim crack criteria for uh, multiple myeloma. That is elevated calcium, renal complications, anemia and bone disease. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the bone marrow should be uh, more than 60%. Uh, and serum light chain ratio will be more than 100 and in MRI more than one focal lesion of light equation will be present. 
and this is slip criteria like more than 60 percent plasma cytosis and light change will be more than 100 and MRI uh, more than one population will be present. So not all the patients will be uh, having all the symptoms, all the criteria. Uh, maybe only one of the criteria will be patient present in uh, most of the patients. And uh, we have to, if it is more, if the bone marrow is more than 60 percent, we definitely conclude it as myeloma. One more thing to mention is that most of the patients present to orthopedicians with complaints of back pain. And uh, when they are evaluated with some imaging, they might have some multiple lytic lesions. At that point of time, the orthopedicians will have a differential diagnosis of uh, some metastasis of a, some unknown origin, uh, say for example, lung or breast in an elder age group or uh, maybe myeloma, if multiple lytic lesions are present uh, in a multiple vertical body, this, these two will be the differential diagnosis. So, so for the next line of uh, investigations will be uh, to do the uh, renal function test, rule out anemia, then uh, evaluate the entire uh, 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 bones with the help of, uh, with help of uh, uh, x-rays. And uh, the one more thing I have mentioned is that the, uh, uh, spectrum of uh, myeloma that is MGUS or small cell myeloma. Sometimes patient may be, may be incidentally found to have uh, elevated proteins, and when we evaluate the plasma cells, will be uh, less than 50 percent, uh, less than 10 percent, and there might not be any endogen damage uh, in those patients. And uh, finally, after a uh, humpty number of tests, we will classify them as MGUS, and for that kind of patient, they might not need any treatment also. They may be kept on follow-up and the rate of transition of MGUS into myeloma is less than 1%. And uh, small ring myeloma, the plasma cells will be 10 to 60%. And here also there will no, no, not be any end of end organ damages seen in the uh, patients, but uh, they should be kept on follow-up as the transition of small ring myeloma to my, uh, multiple myeloma is around 10%. So moving on to the treatment, uh, once the patient has come, we have evaluated the complete number of investigations and uh, a few words about the treatment. Now we have uh, quadruple regimen, like four drugs are uh, considered into the treatment of multiple myeloma. I'll just mention about those drugs also. So initially three drugs, so the bortezomib, uh, dilanidomide and dexamethasone. These were the three drugs which were used initially. Now a new drug called, that is a targeted therapy against uh, one of the uh, CD38, that is called daratinumab, is actually considered into the uh, treatment regimen upfront. Uh, the one more thing about daratinumab is that it is very expensive. Expensive in the sense its cost in lakhs. So we should, uh, if the patient is affordable, we can uh, take it into consideration in the upfront management itself. Otherwise, in our uh, uh, country where it is a middle class uh, uh, patients we have to enter up and look to our clinics, we can consider a three drug regimen which includes bortezomib, linalidomide and dexamethasone. And this has to be given weekly over uh, uh, subsequent weeks and after uh, a period of six months we can uh, uh, take them up for re-evaluation so that these plasma, uh, uh, the, which ha we have to look for the decrease in the plasma cells and the uh, uh, protein will be, uh, uh, serum electrophoresis that will be decreased in the uh, protein cells. So one more thing is that if the patient is young and fit enough, we should decide that the patient, whether the patient will be uh, fit enough for the autologous stem cell transplant. So autologous stem cell transplant is that we have to take a decision upfront. So if the patient is fit enough for autologous stem cell transplant, we have to give uh, uh, the chemotherapy over a period of six months and then take up uh, assess the patient for the autologous stem cell transplant. In case the patients the patients are elderly and uh, frail and they are uh, uh, age more than 60 years with multiple comorbidities, so that they may not be fit for uh, transplant, we can uh, keep them up on maintenance therapy after a period, uh, uh, remission period. Also, they can kept on maintenance therapy. If the patient is fit for transplant, after uh, once the disease has come into remission, we can take up for autologous stem cell transplant and then keep them, the, uh, keep them up for maintenance. Autologous stem cell transplant for myeloma offers uh, definitive progression-free uh, survival for the patient and uh, it delays the recurrence of the disease for the patient. 
is about the off-lab stem cell transplant. So we should decide it upfront itself. And uh, these are the regimens which are used in subsequent line of management. As I mentioned earlier, the bortezone of dexamethasone and the linalizomide form the initial uh, form of treatment for the patient. And the newer drug is the daratumumab, which forms the quadruple regimen for the patient. And in, in case the patient uh, fails or uh, recurs uh, subsequently after, say, for example, one year or after autologous stem cell transplant, we have multiple uh, drugs in the pipeline which have been emerged to be uh, prove, uh, proven to be beneficial. Say, for example, carfilzomin are the second line drugs after bortezomib, subsequent uh, line of management after bortezomib, carfilzomin, then formalidomide. This can be used in a mix and match manner in a subsequent line of management. Uh, this is the same thing, like uh, this case stands for the uh, uh, carcel zone, dinazomide and dexamethasone. So they have uh, done an analysis of the carcel zone. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, this dinazomide forms one of the important drugs in the management of myeloma. Initially, thalidomide was used. Thalidomide uh, causes uh, definitive side effects like constipation, deep venous thrombosis and all. And one more thing to mention about inalidomide is, uh, patient, uh, in, most of the patient may, might have increased uh, renal function test, like the elevated creatinine will be definitely present in most of the patients. In such cases, linalidomide to be uh, avoided and that time we can use a simple drug of thalidomide which offers definitive uh, remission rate in cases of myeloma. And subsequent uh, drugs in the same uh, same spectrum as the pomalidomide which can be used in the successive uh, treatment arm. So these are the various uh, drugs which can be used in co combination uh, which offers definitive uh, progression free survival rate for the patient. Uh, as I mentioned it is the daratumumab, linalidomide, daratumumab, carfilzomib, uh, carfilzomib, pomalidomide. It is used in various combinations. So DEXA forms the basic backbone of the uh, management of myeloma. So uh, nowadays we have the new therapy called the CAR T cell therapy which is just evolving and it has uh, been uh, introduced into the myeloma management also and uh, these are the few drugs about the CAR T cell therapy. So, uh, this is the same thing only. Once the patient has relapsed after the linalidomide, we have to uh, switch over to the other drug of teratumumab, linalidomide, and dexa, or switch over to pomalidomide, or switch over to carfilzomib. These are the trials, so, so I won't go into much details of these things. Uh, so I just want to recapitulate uh, what I have told. Uh, mostly myeloma is a diagnosis of exclusion in most uh, clinical scenarios. They are, mostly the patient uh, land up in orthopedician clinic with the complaints of back pain or some pathological fracture. At that time when we uh, evaluate with the imaging, we might have multiple light equations. So definitely a metastasis of unknown origin or uh, myeloma should be kept at the back of the uh, mind. And uh, in case it plans up in a nephrologist clinic with elevated renal uh, clinical parameters, that time also we have to definitely evaluate for uh, myeloma. And only anemia can also be a presenting feature. Hypercalcemia alone can be a presenting feature. So uh, in such scenarios, we should keep uh, uh, to do. Uh, we should offer the patient serum electrophoresis to uh, further evaluate for myeloma and do uh, subsequently do a bone marrow also. So uh, and. Uh, uh, for, uh, for the after the evaluation part coming to the treatment, we have to decide after whether it is a patient eligible for transplant or not eligible. If it is transplant eligible, we can use quadruple four drug regimen uh, if the patient is affordable because definitely cost plays an important role in uh, management because it is so much costly that newer drug. So if it is and if it is fit enough and affordable, we have to offer in the four drug regimen or at least the three three drug regimen which is the has been used for a longer duration and it offers definitive remission in a multiple myeloma. And down the line, we have multiple drugs to use in combinations, vice versa, uh, in subsequent line of management. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a chronic disease, but it can be the duration of life can be definitely elong uh, elongated with the newer modalities of management available right now. 
and uh, CAR T cell is a new therapy which is also in rats evolution and uh, right now we are uh, trying uh, to bring it to India also, outside India it is uh, being done. So I have just uh, spoken about uh, superficially about myeloma, I have not gone into the trials in detail. Any questions are we having to In the case of myeloma, uh, like autologous uh, stem cell transplant is used in solid uh, solid uh, hematological disorders like lymphomas and myeloma. Allogenic transplant is then taking other blood. This is autologous, same take the patient's own blood. Or allogenic is uh, done for the leukemia. Uh, in AML, AL, where, where they uh, mask the donor and do the allogenic transplant. Here, for autologous stem cell transplant used in a myeloma, the patient uh, remains disease free definitely at least for three years, but there is a chance of relapse also. After even after... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because uh, right now we also keep them on maintenance drug also. So, it is like 50% chances of relapse are right. Not all the patients in the lab. 50% chances of relapse are right. Even with maintenance therapy, it's uh, the period of uh, disease free interval will be uh, prolonged. But chance of delay, uh, relapse will be well, uh, it's delayed Delay. later. Yes. Uh, once the patient is disease free, uh, after the, he has achieved the remission, uh, the patient, uh, uh, they are given high dose chemotherapy, sir. So that all their. Uh, uh, myeloma cells are suppressed and their uh, uh, peripheral blood is collected and they are subjected to a, uh, their uh, preserved cell. Then after they achieve the nadir count, like, like that, uh, like uh, all the, they will be made, made neutropenics. And after that, this new cells will be uh, introduced into the same patient. Their own blood cells, after they are given high dose chemotherapy, they will be uh, delivered this blood and this will be allowed to regenerate. Allogenic is for uh, uh, leukemia and uh, AML, ALL. So where uh, they see the 10 by 10 match, 10 by 10 match may be a sibling or uh, an unrelated donor also. And uh, we see a uh, haplotype uh, match of the patients. Patients in the sense patient and the sibling or the patient and the unrelated donor. And that is allogenic is for leukemia. Sir. Autologous is for uh, relapsed lymphomas, myelomas, is for uh, For that, autologous is also. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Because uh, most of the patients come with a back pain only, so that is how they get diagnosed. Or they end up in nephrologist clinics. With elevated reaction and after evaluation, there are uh, all these protein uh, rises found out, and after that, they do a serum and process, and the immune fixation is done, pre lighting assay is done, uh, bone marrow is also accomplished from the uh, evaluation. What is the earliest stage you see this myeloma? Sir, myeloma is itself an advanced story, sir. Like, uh, maybe if the patient has a uh, lesser number of lytic bone lesions, he may have a lesser symptom, sir. Because some patients have multiple lytic lesions. So, some patients may have only two to three lytic lesions with them. So, the morbidity of the patient may vary, sir, based upon the number of lytic lesions or the creatinine. So, for some patients, it will be elevated only uh, marginally, sir. Say, for example, it may be two, three, or 1.5 like that only. And for some patients, it may not be elevated. So, these comorbidities or the uh, uh, severity of the disease will definitely uh, uh, reflect in the uh, treatment part, treatment part also. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Chandralekar, for the talk and for the, for the discussion. There are no more queries. You, uh, may I request uh, Nirmala Madam? to award the certificate to the speaker.
responses to the end of the 487th CME of IMH and Ekoda Bakam. And we'll meet you all at the 488th CME of IMH and Ekoda Bakam. Yes, sir. So this gives me the thing. We are achieving, we are going to do something.